So we've covered all these different worldviews. We've covered the Aristotelian worldview, the Cartesian, Newtonian, the contemporary. What is it that makes one worldview different from others? If I change something very, very tiny in my theory, let's say in my chemical theory, or let's say in a biological theory, would that make it a new worldview? Probably not. So it's safe to say that there are some essential components to every worldview. Components that are essential to a degree when you change them, you get a new worldview. So what are those key elements? The answer is, a worldview is characterized by its metaphysical components. What on earth is this? What is metaphysical? You know some of them. So if we take hylomorphism, what's hylomorphism? Everything is matter and form. Pluralism, what's pluralism? Different substances. Yeah, that there are many different substances. This is the idea. There are as many substances as there are types of things. Teleology, what's teleology? Everything in the universe has a goal. That's what teleology is. The idea that everything has a certain goal. That is not something that we nowadays accept. Planism. This is the idea that the universe is full, that there is no empty space. Then we have heterogeneity. This is the idea that there are two different regions in the universe, and these regions obey different laws. Again, something we no longer accept. Finite universe, universe has physical boundaries, and then you have monotheism, one God. So these here are some of the metaphysical components of the Aristotelian worldview. These isms are your answers to a number of important metaphysical questions. This is the metaphysics implicit in a worldview. This is what we call metaphysics. And it's these things that characterize a worldview. Let's take the Cartesian now. And in Cartesian we have mechanicism, the idea that material objects are composed of bits of interacting matter. Dualism, what's dualism? Two substances, matter and mind, okay. Action by contact. It says that there is no such thing as action at the distance, essentially, that every influence assumes some immediate contact. Dualistic determinism. While in the material world, all events are strictly deterministic, a mind is free to act spontaneously. And then you have planism, again, the idea that everything is full and there's no empty space, homogeneity, the opposite of heterogeneity, that you have one set of laws that work for the whole universe. And then you have infinite universe, universe with no physical boundaries, and then you have monotheism again, one God. This would be your Cartesian metaphysical assumption. What about Newton? We go to the Newtonian worldview and we get dynamism. This is the idea that matter is essentially the extended substance that interacts through forces, not only by actual contact. You see, they never deny the actual contact, but it's contact plus forces. And then you have dualism. Again, you have action at a distance. Then you have dualistic determinism, vacuism, which is the opposite of planism. The empty space is possible and the space is a separate substance. Homogeneity, again, infinite universe and monotheism. And then this brings us to our contemporary metaphysical assumptions, which would include wave particle duality, and then you have materialism, one substance, and that substance is matter. And then you have probabilistic determinism. All events have certain causes, but the same initial conditions may produce different effects. And then you have agnosticism, which is not the same as atheism. And this would be some of our contemporary metaphysical assumptions, and this is not all of it. We're talking about other assumptions, but we never covered those. Contact or action at a distance? There is no ready answer to this question. Unfortunately, no. We have quantum teleportation. Have you ever heard of that? This is not science fiction. This is, this is reality. Is this action at a distance? Then quantum entanglement. You do something on this particle and that particle over there changes. Is this action at a distance? This is really spooky. We don't really know what to make of it. Vacuism or planism? Yes, we accept the conception of space-time of general relativity, but what does it tell us in terms of 
the nature of space-time. Is space-time something like a separate substance that can exist without material objects, or is it a property of material objects? It's not as simple. So I'm leaving this open. Infinite or finite? Yes, we don't seem to believe that there are any physical boundaries. We don't seem to believe in anything like that. But is it possible for a finite universe to be boundless? Boundless, but finite. You know, curved in such a way that no matter what direction you go, there is no boundary. And yet, if you keep going straight, you're going to come back. Those models are a possibility, and we're not really sure whether our universe is infinite and boundless or finite and boundless. That's why I keep this question open. This is where we stand. Now, it's safe to say that the transition from one worldview to the next involves some changes in our metaphysical assumptions. So what's metaphysics? There is no universal definition for this sort of things. You know, there are as many definitions as there are philosophers. But this is a working definition. A set of views about the world taken as one entity, as a whole. It's not about this or that species or this or that element. It's about the world taken as one thing, as one entity. When you try to make sense of the universe taken as one. And this would include questions like this one. Can matter exist without mind? Or can mind exist without matter? Materialism, idealism, dualism, neutral monism. Next question, what are the essential properties of matter? And here you have your Cartesian notion of matter, matter as extension. Then you have your dynamic notion of matter, matter, which is extension plus forces. Then you have the contemporary notion of matter, which is waves and particles together, wavicles. So all those would be attempts to answer this question. And then you have, is space a substance? Can there be empty space? Can there be space without any matter? Then this one, does God exist? It's also a metaphysical question. Is the universe homogeneous or heterogeneous? Is the future of the universe strictly determined? Is there free will? Does the universe have boundaries in space and time? So all of this would be metaphysical issues. And every worldview provides some kind of an answer, at least to some of this. You see, you don't really need to have clear-cut answers to all of these questions to have a worldview. In some cases, we just don't know. Just like nowadays, there might be a question or two to which we don't have an answer. And yet, it is safe to say that at least some of these questions are answered in any worldview. If you summarize it, it's the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. What's the answer? 42. 42. Okay, how many of you understand the reference? All right, that's very good. For the rest of you, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Douglas Adams? So we know the answer then. That's 42. That's what you learn in this course. <laughs> okay. This is an important point. When it comes to metaphysical assumptions, they may or may not be explicitly stated. Sometimes they are explicitly stated, meaning they are part of your university curricula, they are included in encyclopedias, textbooks. But very often, especially these days, they are not explicitly stated. Many of these assumptions that I was talking about, materialism, yes, people talk about it, but you're not, you're not gonna read about that much in your physics textbook or probabilistic determinism. It's something that follows from our theories, but it's not something that is necessarily openly formulated. In the Aristotelian and the Cartesian mosaics, most metaphysical components were explicitly stated. That's why we had tiny little tiles for metaphysics. In the Newtonian and the contemporary worldviews, we don't have a separate tile for metaphysics. And this is an indication that in those worldviews, most of the metaphysical assumptions were tacit, were under the surface. They weren't necessarily openly stated. Again, this doesn't mean that there were no metaphysical assumption was openly stated since the 1800s. That's not what I'm saying, okay? Regardless of your attitude towards metaphysics, one thing is clear, it's always gonna be there. Either you openly formulate it, or it's gonna enter your worldview from the back door. We're gonna go 3D now. Here you have metaphysics, and this is your Newtonian metaphysics. Things like action at a distance. Most likely you wouldn't come across this assumption in any of the textbooks or encyclopedias. It wasn't part of really the university science curriculum, was it? 
but it was part of many theories, such as the law of gravity, when you have things like apples pulled by the Earth without any actual contact, and then you have the same gravitational relation between the Moon and the Earth. And it was also implicit in other theories. Coulomb's law of electrostatics. You have opposite charges that attract each other. Pay attention, no mediating agents here. And then you have like charges repelling each other. Again, no agents. It's all action at a distance. Consider this one. Dynamical conception of matter. The idea that matter is the extended substance that interacts through forces. Was it implicit in the Newtonian worldview? Yes, it was. It's safe to say it was. But it wasn't something openly stated that we subscribe to the dynamical conception of matter. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. But we believe that the Newtonian worldview had this metaphysical assumption implicit in it. Why do we believe in that? Think of those theories in which this assumption was implicit. Danny here? Is it Newtonian physics? Okay. What else? Magnetism. Right. The forces could be physical, like a magnetic force, or they could be chemical, like a chemical affinity, or it could be a life force, vital force. In all of these cases, you have the same conception of matter. You have something extended interacting through some kind of forces. Let's consider this one then, the contemporary one. How do you like the small wavicles here, tiny wavicles? Probabilistic determinism. This is the idea that the future is not strictly determined, that there are options. Even the name itself is essentially our invention. But is it safe to say that this is implicit in many of our theories? So this is the idea. If you accept quantum physics, then there are options, but the options are limited. It can stay as it is, or it can decay. The options are limited. The same thing with a double slit experiment. There is a high probability that it will strike in one of the bright bands. But which one exactly? The theory doesn't tell you. And we believe that this is because nature itself is probabilistic. You don't have much choice. Either you take your contemporary theory seriously and draw all the consequences that follow from them, or you say, in the future, we will know. Yeah, we may as well. But at the moment, this is what your theories tell you. And it's not just quantum physics. Many other accepted theories have the same thing implicit. Genetics, we have economics, many, many other things. All agree with the idea that it should not necessarily be explicitly stated? Very good. Some philosophers, especially those whom we call logical positivists, they believe that you can have scientific theories with no metaphysics whatsoever. That you can have your theories, but metaphysics, we don't know really the answers to those questions, and uh, it's just uh, meaningless gibberish. So it has to be put aside. It has to be rejected completely. But as a result of that, metaphysics entered into the mosaic from the back door. So the choice is really simple. Either you discuss metaphysical issues openly and try to make sense of those issues in an open and critical manner, or you just leave things to their natural course and metaphysics will find its place in the mosaic anyways. You're going to have something tailor-made or something homemade. The choice is yours. What about this question? What can possibly alter our worldview? I'm going to give you three hypothetical discoveries and you tell me which one of these discoveries you think can alter our metaphysics. Discovery number one, bat fossil, a primitive bat fossil. Discovery number two, a Precambrian rabbit. Can anyone tell me why this is such a huge thing? This is the rabbit and this is the trilobite here. Why is this a huge thing? Yeah, Jacob there? Because rabbits didn't exist in the Precambrian era. Everything was in a much smaller form like the trilobites. Essentially, yes. If we take our contemporary view on the subject, this is here a geologic timeline, as we nowadays think of it. Now pay attention here. So we have Cenozoic period, Mesozoic, Paleozoic. According to the currently accepted view, all mammal fossils must be Cenozoic, which is roughly, even in the best case scenario, that's 65 million years ago. If that discovery actually took place, it would suggest that here, this is your Precambrian period. This is your Cambrian, you see? 
has to be before that. So 10 times the age, essentially, okay, before this tiny little trilobite here. It should be somewhere here. So this is your discovery, a Precambrian rabbit. And I'm going to give you another one, angel fossils. Suppose this is not fake, that this is a genuine thing. We don't really know what to make of it, but it's not fake. We just found this creature, whatever it was. It's a genuine thing. So you have three hypothetical discoveries. Which of the three you think will necessarily alter our worldview? I'm talking the 21st century. Now, given our current method, given our current worldview, which of these three you think would necessarily alter our worldview? Suppose you are the biology community here and you really believe in a theory of evolution. This is what you were taught in school. And then somebody comes up with these discoveries. How would you react, Danny? I would first question the validity of the discovery. Suppose it turns out that all the carbon dating and all other analysis show that this is a genuine thing. Then I would uh, question the theories that I already have accepted. Would you reject the theory of evolution altogether? No, but I would see what other um, factors may have come into play in creating this fossil. Very good. Now, suppose for the sake of argument that you don't have an alternative theory, that there is no other theory that really explains why you must have Precambrian rabbits, and it's just one case, it's just an anomaly. How would you react to that? If you have no theory to replace evolution with, then it's just going to stay in the mosaic until you can come up with an explanation for it. I think that's exactly how the scientific community is going to react. And we know this. This is not just a hypothesis. It has happened many times in the history of science. Even our best scientific theories have always faced anomalies. You take your Newtonian theory and you have the anomaly of Mercury's perihelion. I think we covered that. Then nowadays we have a serious issue with black holes when it's supposed to be explicable both in terms of quantum physics and general relativity and yet when you apply both of them at the same time you arrive at contradictory results. If you go back to the history of science, the Aristotelian period, modern period, all of the famous theories had anomalies. And what happens to these anomalies? Very often, these anomalies are just being shelved. We try to come up with an explanation, but as long as there is no alternative theory, these discoveries are not really threatening. You understand why? Scientific inertia. If we were to reject our theories because of one or even ten disconfirming instances, we would never have anything to show. And this is the protective mechanism in science. It is because of our tolerance towards contradictions. You remember we covered this. Our compatibility criteria, what are they? We are tolerant towards contradictions. Why is that? Because we are fallibilists and we understand that our theories are not perfect. Therefore, it is quite possible for them to have false consequences. It's quite possible. So what do you do? You have two options. Reject the theory, remain with nothing, or be patient. But what about the angel fossils? What's going to happen then? Back to the good old days of monotheism, you think? <laughs> How would you react? Jacob, want to try? Um, I think it would have to really be investigated as just an evolutionary anomaly that there's the potential for something like that to have happened at some point, but I don't think it would really elicit the kind of reaction that would support monotheism, just make us question, do we fully understand evolution at this point? All in favor? How many of you think that once this sort of thing is discovered, the whole scientific community readily switched back to some non-evolutionary biological theory, and as a result of that, a creationist account of things? How many of you think that this is what's going to happen? That's very good, at least one person. How many of you think that we're going to stick to our biological theory and even if there is no explanation to this phenomenon whatsoever, it's just going to be shelved? Again, you understand why. We are fallibilists. And as long as we don't have anything better, we're not going to reject our contemporary theory. So, the answer is none. None of this would alter our worldview necessarily. So how do you make these discoveries 
really matter? According to our contemporary hypothetical deductive method, what do you have to do? You have to create a theory such that makes a novel prediction, and one of these just happened to be its novel prediction. So if you had a theory, let's say an alternative evolutionary account, from which it really followed that there must exist Precambrian rabbits and many other Precambrian creatures, and then this was discovered after the creation of your theory. This would be a good indication. But then again, only if you had an alternative theory that explained everything that is currently explained by our current evolutionary theory, and this was a novel prediction. In that case, you'd say, well, this makes sense. And then and only then, would consider rejecting our biological theory. The diagnosis is a worldview can be altered only with the acceptance of new theories which change our metaphysical assumptions. And according to our current hypothetical deductive method, an individual discovery can't alter anything unless it is a confirmed novel prediction of some new theory. Then and only then. Obviously, when our method changes in the future, there might be some other scenarios, but we're talking now at this moment. As long as we employ the hypothetical deductive method, this is the only scenario. Is this clear? Very good. Now, this is the time when I'm going to ask you to debunk those myths that we discussed in our first lecture. That science began in the 17th century. That Galileo was a martyr of science who fought against the dogmatism of clergy. That the scientific revolution liberated science from religion. That nowadays we believe that God does not exist and that contemporary science is independent from any metaphysics. So I need volunteers, take one at a time, starting from this one, and tell me why it's wrong. What's wrong with the idea that science began in the 17th century? What risk would we be taking there? Basically, you put yourself at the risk of having people in the future assume that the science that we have today is not science for the same reasons. Yeah, essentially that is the risk you take. And so anytime when there's a major change in the scientific method, then all the science before that shift becomes non-scientific. And you don't really want that. You don't want to be one of those who live in a timeless bubble, which assumes that the whole history of the humanity can be roughly divided into three unequal periods. One is from the creation of whatever, the Big Bang, all the way to their grandmothers. <laughs> This is the so-called prehistory. <laughs> and then there is the actual history of which they are aware, photographs and video, whatever. That's from their parents all the way until like a week ago. <laughs> that's the history. And then there is the now, which is like now. <laughs> the choice is ours. If we don't know the history, we have this timeless bubble. We are the first generation on Earth. No, we're not. So this is debunk. What's wrong with the next one? Galileo was a martyr of science who fought against the dogmatism of the clergy. Anyone would like to debunk this myth? I think it'd be more accurate to say that the clergy was, uh, their view was representative of the scientific worldview at the time, and Galileo was someone whose theory just couldn't satisfy the method at the time. Essentially, yes, that is the answer. This interpretation is extremely anachronistic because it doesn't take into account the state of the mosaic of the time. We take it out of its historical context and we say, oh, Galileo's theory, well, Copernicus's theory and Galileo's theory, it had confirmed novel predictions. The phases of Venus, right? Why wasn't it accepted? So everyone who didn't accept it were dogmatic. What's wrong with this interpretation? Well, they didn't care about confirmed novel predictions back then. The method of the time was different. They were doing what any proper scientist would do. Stick to the method you have. So this has to go. What about this one, that the scientific revolution liberated science from religion? Do you have anything against this view? Dave? It's false because religion, first of all, continues for a long time in it, and simply because you're changing the method, it doesn't necessarily remove pieces from the mosaic unless it gets replaced by something else. Dave is absolutely correct. Theology remained part of the scientific mosaic long after the scientific revolution of the 17th, 18th century. So this is false. What about this one? God does not exist. This is what scientists believe these days. Yep. Contemporary science doesn't say that God doesn't exist. It just says that um, God, we cannot know through our science if he does or does not exist. Exactly. 
That's the difference between atheism and agnosticism and the view that the scientific community implicitly accepts is agnosticism, that we are not in a position to settle this issue one way or the other. So, and it's not really a scientific issue. This is the current position. Very good. What about this one? Contemporary science is independent from any metaphysics. I think I said enough about this already. I think you know the answer. Many metaphysical assumptions are still implicit in our contemporary mosaic and there is nothing you can do because it's inevitable. The moment you take your theories seriously as descriptions of the world out there, you're gonna have some metaphysical assumptions. Want it or not, it's inevitable. Let's now proceed to philosophical assumptions. Science proves its theories by experiments and observations. The method of science is universal and unchangeable and because there is a universal and unchangeable method, that's why the science is rational. Each succeeding scientific theory contains more and more true claims. And finally, there is a strict demarcation line between science and pseudoscience. Let's take the first one. Science proves its theories by experiments and observations. Anything wrong here? Max? First, empirical science doesn't prove anything. It verifies. And secondly, our science hasn't throughout all of history used experiments and observations. That's as perfect an answer as it gets, really, both theoretical and historical. Very good. This is even better than the one I have on the screen. Much better. <laughs> what about this one? The method of science is universal and unchangeable. Give me two reasons, historical and theoretical now. Danny? We see historically that there have been different methods of science, and the unchangeability would go against our fallibilist views because it's we can't have a perfect method, right? So how is it that we arrive at the dynamic method thesis from fallibilism? Fallibilism just says that our theories are changeable. And then the dynamic method thesis, the one that we're looking for, says that the methods are changeable. How does this connection work? Anyone? Rob, want to try? It's because a method is a deductive consequence of implicit other methods that are already existent and accepted theories. So if theories change, your methods are going to change. So it's because of the third law. You have to have the third law, which tells you the mechanism of the method employment. Methods become employed when they deductively follow from the accepted theories. And since the theories are changeable by fallibilism, we theoretically know that there can never be such a thing as an unchangeable method of science. What about this one? What makes science rational? is the existence of this universal method of science. You think that's what makes science rational. So the moment we discover that there is no such thing as a universal method of science, science becomes an irrational activity. Do you agree with this interpretation? I think since there is no universal scientific method, that what makes science uh, rational is that the laws behind scientific change, it's universal. Exactly. What we think makes science a rational activity is the fact that it obeys a certain set of laws. And this is what makes it a law-governed rational activity, not the existence of a universal unchangeable method. Very good. What about this one? Each succeeding scientific theory contains more and more strictly true claims. So if you compare the current theories with the theories of the past, what you end up noticing is that the current theories have more true claims as opposed to false claims. This is a really a tricky formulation. The idea here is along the lines of the selective scientific realism, if you remember that view, which is for every scientific theory, you can distinguish between the false claims and the true claims. And as we proceed, the future theories manage to have, it just so happens, that the future theories have more true claims and fewer false claims. I want you to criticize this idea, and this is where the, the root of the problem is. Here? My name is Alon. A claim can be only partially true and partially false. Essentially, yes. That is the major criticism of this view. Very good. We are in no position to tell which claims of science are strictly true and which are strictly false. What we can hope to achieve is that the future theories are slightly more truth-like than the theories of the past, but not in a sense that they contain more true claims, not in that sense. You can't really draw a strict demarcation line between this is what's true about this theory and this is what's false about this theory. That's not how it works. If it were the case, why would we hold on to the false claims, right? We just eliminate them. Every single claim is truth-like. 
Very good. And what about the final one, that there is a strict demarcation line between scientific theories and non-scientific theories? What do you think about this? Again, give me both a historical reason and a theoretical reason. So given what we've said previous, uh, I would say that there isn't a strict demarcation line between science and pseudoscience because some of our current theories uh, that we think are scientific now could be considered pseudoscientific in the future. Okay, so historically speaking, we've seen that theories that are considered scientific in one time period are considered pseudoscientific in the next one and then it goes back and forth. So this is the historical argument. So what was the major theoretical reason why we believe that there can be no such thing as a fixed demarcation criteria? Dave? The third law of scientific change under which you have the demarcation criteria, if you're going to be fallibilist about what your theories are and then what your methods are, then you have to also be a fallibilist of what constitutes a science. Essentially you're saying demarcation criteria are just part of the method of the time. Yeah, that's very good. So this is the last myth to debunk. Now this is the time when I have to say thank you. I wish you all the very best of fortune and hope to see you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.